Hello, all you people out there in Zoom land. My name is Ken Boyer. I'm a member of FOPCON, and I'm a volunteer at the conservatory in the desert. Despite COVID-19, the Friends of the Conservatory are continuing our commitment to our educational mission. So tonight I'm pleased to host this Zoom session on growing succulents. Thanks for joining us. I personally got interested in these plants nearly 50 years ago. At that time, my wife Sue and I lived in Arizona while I served in the US Public Health Service. What appealed to me about these plants were their toughness, their unusual shapes and sizes, and their surprisingly gorgeous flowers, which occasionally would appear. Believe it or not, a couple of those plants that we acquired when we lived in the Southwest are still part of our little botanic garden in our house. Our speaker tonight is Kent Gentry. Kent is in charge of the greenhouses at the conservatory. He has a degree in horticulture from the University of Missouri at Columbia and has 15 years of experience in propagating and nurturing all kinds of plants. And I can tell you from personal experience that he knows a lot about the subject of our session tonight. Um, we'll hold questions uh, for Kent until the end of his presentation, but you can enter them as he goes along using the Zoom chat box. So without further ado, here is Kent Gentry. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, attending and showing up. Um, this is the first Zoom lecture I've given, not the first lecture, so bear with me. I'm going to try to speak clearly, and our moderators will let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so we're going to talk about succulents, and have I shared the screen yet, Judy? No. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share a screen of the slideshow. Everybody should see that. So welcome to our Looks talk. Good. Oh, thank you. Uh, welcome to our talk about succulents. Um, I'm Kent Gentry, the greenhouse supervisor. Um, I've put my email at the bottom of this first slide if you need to contact me about the contents of this uh, presentation, presentation or anything else. Um, so we're going to talk about succulents. I agree with Ken on a lot of this. This is a, this is a very tough plant with multiple uses. Um, they're very hop popular house plants now and it's probably one of the number one questions I get at the conservatory about how to take care of plants. So for this presentation I'm going to cover some of the basics on uh, how to take care of them, some, what are some of the proper cultural techniques, and then we're going to talk about some of the types of them. Because the other fascinating thing about this plants is that there's a wide variety of them. And um, uh, they're all pretty fairly easy to grow, but not all available in the nursery trade. Um, and so I'm going to, how do I scroll your screen sharing? I can't really control the slide at this point. So it says I'm screen sharing, but I can't. Let me pause share and do a new share. One maybe I can control. Let's try this. Can everybody see that? No. We're still on. Yes, we can see uh, the succulent homepage. It's can can you advance better. it? Now, can you see the whole program now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start from beginning. There we go. Great. 
Uh, now it's growing. Now it's growing. Okay, so what is a succulent? Um, generally, it's not talking about one different type of plants. It's on a couple different levels. So first, we want to talk about um, uh, succulent is basically any plant that stores water in its leaves, stems, tubers, or roots. Um, technically, that can include very common plants like begonias um, in the stems, and it can include tulips uh, in the bulb. Uh, so this is more a, this is not a scientific term, this is a descriptive term. And on the second level, in the nursery trade, succulents have become a class of, a cl I use that word loosely, a class of plants. Um, and uh, this includes cactus, agaves, and aloes. Um, also sedums, uh, sempervivums, and the jade plant, or crassula. Um, because there's over 10,000 species of succulents, I am not going to talk about all of them. <laughs> we would be here for days. Um, so I'm not gonna really talk about cactus. I'm not gonna really talk about agave. Um, I'm gonna talk about the succulents that you're going to see uh, at the conservatory and at other nursery, retail nurseries. Um, and the ones I usually get questions about. Um, and these are still uh, thousands of plants. Um, and at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about the different types that are more common. Um, the one thing they do have in common is they're all low maintenance, drought tolerant, and very easy to maintain and very easy to grow. Um, you're gonna find these plants uh, from mountaintops to seaside, in arid places, in temperate places, in tropical places and subtropical places. So it's a wide variety. And that includes a wide variety of temperatures, light, and precipitation. Um, the first thing you talk about when you talk about any plant is soil. So the one thing in common with all succulents is they require good drainage and soil drainage. Um, I've selected three. Um, I've used all of these personally or professionally. Um, these are these are uh, over the counter. These are you know labeled for. You know, the middle one is palm, cactus, and citrus. Um, so there's some overlap, but generally what they have in common is they're uh, very well-drained soils. Um, and they're anywhere from the price range of eight to $16. So uh, if and when you have suc succulents, um, you wanna make sure you have the proper soil mix. Um, the first one, the miracle Grow, is something you're gonna find at any big box store. It's, uh, medium quality, um, it's uh, consistent quality though. You're always gonna get the same thing. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive, um, so it's uh, readily available. Um, the middle one is, um, I included that one. I use this one out west a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's an organic product. Um, and you can tell that from the lower corner of the bag, the lower left corner of, of my side, where it says Omri. And that is a, uh, a trade mark, uh, or uh, it's showing you that that has been some sort of research done into its organic qualities um, for a retail product. And I've used this one personally. However, what I would say is it's a bit toothy or gravelly, and it's really excellent for outdoors. It's a bit rough on the indoors, unless you're doing a very large <laughs> project. Um, and then the third one is probably the like Lamborghini. Uh, it's a really nice uh, quality mix. It's Pro Mix, which is a, a name brand. It's a little higher priced at about $16. We're talking about the eight quart bags. So the small bags. Um, and uh, excellent drainage, um, excellent. It's got a, um, a mycorrhizae that's been in, introduced into it, as well as some fertilizers. Um, so with either of them, you can't go wrong. I personally use the miracle Grow a lot as a base, and then I'll add to it. Um, and at the conservatory, we use the Pro Mix, or many times Ken will make his own mix, which you are more than, it's very, very easy to do. 
Um, you, for instance, um, on the first one, this is just, you could use that miracle grow, and then if you're adding a constituent part like perlite, which for, is for drainage, you do a one-to-one, -one, and that's a perfectly adequate, that's, uh, we use that soil a lot for most of our succulents. Um, it's very easy and quick to mix. If you want to get a bit fancier, you can, you can um, create your own recipe. <laughs> so what I've included is a simple recipe that's just very general and you can get as specific as you want. And there's a lot available on the Google machine or YouTubers or things like that. But essentially you're doing one part potting soil, which is a, a, a nutrient, uh, you know, it's holding the nutrients. Um, then you're putting in one part perlite and one part um, of a sharp sand or builder sand. And that's important because it's not too fine. It's got angle, angle it's ang very angular and, and that's for drainage. Um, so you can add other things such as chicken grit, gravel, uh, quar is used, peat is used. You could do that. Anything really to, anything really to create a, a soil composition that's loose and friable and that is easily drained because that's the main key with succulents. Um, Third little thing I want to bring up about soil is generally you have a good soil for succulents if you pre-moisten your soil mix, whether it's something you buy or you create yourself. And if you make a ball with that, hold it for a few seconds and then open your palm. And if it falls apart, like in the picture, that's going to tell you that you have a very well-drained soil. Makes sense, right? Um, conversely, if you would hold that in a ball and open your hand and it doesn't, <laughs> it's still a ball, that's a very clayey soil. So what the picture's indicating and what, what succulent soil are, are requiring are some, some sort of angular composition in there for that drainage. Um, use your creativity, do some research, and it might also depend on what kind of succulent you're growing once you've done some, uh, a little, you know, a little bit more uh, research on what kind you have. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's for soil. And we're going to move on to water. And this is probably the number one question I get and the number one problem that goes wrong, I think, with succulents. Um, when I started doing some research for this presentation, I saw a lot of, hi, YouTube, and people misting their plants. And I think they do that because it's such a small amount of water. Um, I would say don't do that. Um, I, I, what's happening there is you're getting water onto the, the leaves of the succulent and it could get trapped there. Um, it's much better to do it individually with a small watering can or one of these watering bottles. Um, they're kind of popular now. They're very easy to get. Um, don't ever do wa overhead watering. Um, really don't do any spraying or misting. And that's, you know, the one, the one thing, one tip I give you as a professional with watering. Um, overwatering is, is, well, that's the next slide we're going to talk about. But essentially, if you're putting in just, amount, just the right amount of water that, that I'll describe, um, and it drains through the bottom, uh, your plants aren't going to get soggy, which is the number one killer of these plants. Um, and some of the signs for this overwatering that you're going to see are when, if you look on the, around the base of your succulents, and this happens to the best of us, but what's happening is it's, it, uh, the fleshy leaf is getting too fleshy. It's getting corpulent and flabby, and it's losing its so, so what makes these succulents is there's special cells in the leaves that hold and store water. Um, and so this, the cell structure of that is breaking down. Um, so this is a sure sign that you're overwatering. Uh, what do you do? You pull back your water. Um, generally, depending on the time of year, you can go a week, 10 days, sometimes longer for certain, depending on the size of the plant, for your succulents, not all of your house plants, but these plants can take it um, because they're really holding their, the, the moisture in their leaves. 
Um, you can, for something like this, you can take off the discolored leaves, uh, the rotten leaves, um, and test around a little bit to make sure you don't have root rot. The way you do that is lift the plant out of the pot, lift the pot off the bottom, and if you see brown or soggy or no roots, um, you definitely probably have some root rot problem. You might be able to repropagate this plant, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but definitely pull back on the watering, give it some time to heal, um, maybe a week, a little bit longer. You could cut this plant um, off its stem and try to repropagate it. Um, the other thing sign of water is underwatering. Um, this is less of a problem uh, because, because of course the plant is holding its own water, but if you, this can help you judge how long you can push for your particular plant. Um, and you're gonna look for wrinkled leaves. It's, it's desiccating. Um, fairly easy to solve, you give it water. Um, you don't drown it. You give it the same amount of water that you normally do. And the plant, nine more than nine times out of 10, is gonna pick back up, unless there's another underlying issue or problem. Um, these are very resilient plants, and that's why they're great for the uh, homeowner. Uh, we're gonna move on to light as a basic, uh, one of the basic cares, uh, the basics of succulent care. Um, and this is another question I get a lot, but it's such a wide ranging topic. Um, we all live in different kinds of homes with different kinds of windows. Um, is it an indoor plant or an outdoor succulent? There are some and we will talk about those. Um, so on the pictures I have it are, are the ideal sunny window and then also on, on the lower right hand I have uh, some supplemental lighting which you can see above the, uh, the plants and the tray. And uh, that can be LED or fluorescent. And, and I personally highly recommend that um, because our homes are probably one of the biggest obstacles to, to loving and caring for your, sub, uh, your, your succulents um, because of dim light. And succulents love bright light. Uh, most of them do. Um, so if you, if you have it, put them in an east window. That's brilliant. Um, or filter a filtered south or west exposure would be fine. Um, one way you can sort of recharge them is to do what we call a sun vacation outside and that's moving your plants gradually into a sunny spot, um, you know, at your home or wherever you have for it. And they're, they're small plants, so you do have to be careful when you're moving them in terms of you don't put them right out from a dim house into the bright sunlight because they will get scorched. Um, but let's see what else I can talk about with lighting. Uh, I talked about introducing them slowly to the outside. On the inside, supplemental lighting is perfectly fine. Um, also move your plants around, not daily, um, but if you don't think they're getting enough light or I'm, some of the things I'm gonna show you, try it out in another spot. Um, this slide is basically just some of the, to show you that um, some of the more common succulents aren't going to take the same light conditions. Um, for instance, like the jades uh, really do better with some kind of afternoon. They don't like the, the, the hot afternoon sun. Um, it's going to scald them pretty easily. Um, whereas uh, sedums and things like that, can, you can put them in, they, they love actually hot sun. And a lot, of, a lot of this has to do with where that plant is originally from. Uh, and we're, we'll talk about that when we talk about types of succulents. Um, and this slide should be available to where if you need to get any of this information, um, you can go back and find the slide. Uh, also questions at the end, if as I'm scrolling through these slides, if you see a plant you have or you're interested in, you have a, and I went too fast, please ask that question at the end. Um, so keeping, keeping on with lights with, or with light, um, this is something that you see in people. Uh, so this is your plant is crisping up. It's getting too much light. You're scorching the leaves. It looks a little bit different than a lot of plants when the leaves get scorched. A lot of people don't know, really know what's going on, but if you, it's coming from the edges, it's not going to be just random on the leaf or the petal. 
Um, it's going to be a, a definite pattern that you can tell what's happening. There might even be some desiccation uh, on the leaf, meaning that wrinkled appearance. You'll see that a lot too. Uh, another indicator is your plant is changing color uh, drastically. <laughs> so if it grows from green to red or purple, you might be getting, it might be getting too much light. And that's definitely can be an issue, even with a plant that loves light. A plant that's getting too little light. I see this a lot uh, in home owner situations um, because of that dim light situation. Uh, this is still a viable plant. Um, this plant is getting too little light, so it's actually trying to reach up to the sun or, or the light source that it's getting. It's getting what's called leggy. Um, so when you see that, it's maybe, maybe I put light starvation. That's a little bit severe. Um, but it is definitely a light deficit. Um, and uh, so you can once again, like move this plant around a little bit. Uh, you can see it's dropped its leaves at the bottom of the, the stalk around in the pot. It's, uh, it has dropped leaves. And, and so that's showing you the two that the plant may not be the healthiest um, and uh, might be worth, might be worth uh, taking care of or trying in a new spot. You could also repropagate this plant when it gets, uh, you can't shrink the plant, unfortunately, <laughs> when it gets to this stage. But if you, you'll see this a lot, and this is indicating something to do with light. Um, one thing you can do, I think I should note, is if you're moving from uh, uh, a bright light from the outdoors to the indoors, you give it time to adjust. If you go from the indoors to the outdoors, you give it time to adjust. What do I mean by that? Um, a few days, a week. Um, it depends on what kind of shelter spot you have either way. Um, a, a couple of days, one area in dappled shade into a little bit brighter light until you get it to its final spot is a good, uh, a good practice to have too. Um, otherwise you may get, uh, you know, either, either too little light or too much in the previous slide that I showed you. Um, why do we care about light that probably plants. Um, well, one, we want healthy plants and we want to take care of them. Um, two is on the last bullet point is it's, it can create a generally unhealthy plant and an unhealthy plant is then becomes susceptible to disease or insect infestation. And that's kind of what we'll move on to. Succulents are tough, um, but they also do get insects and other problems. In the greenhouses, at, in the home, I see mealybug all the time. Personally, in my own home, I fight mealybug. It's just sort of a thing that happens. And we'll, sh we'll talk a little bit about some insects that you might have heard of, but you don't know exactly know what to look for. And um, sometimes you may not even see the damage. So I've kind of listed the more common ones, mealybugs, aphids, scale, spider mites. Um, and if you know what you're looking for, and I'll give you some, some simple treatments for them, um, then perhaps you can keep your plant alive a little bit longer. Um, insects, can, uh, insects can definitely do enough damage to the plant where it could kill the plant. Um, you'll have no other choice. So the first one we'll talk about is a mealybug. And this is of course a microscopic. This is a soft bodied scale, if you will. They're tiny, you can see them with your eye. It looks like cotton on the stalk or stem or leaf of your plant is the best way I describe it and I hear other people. But it's actually, a, that's the, the uh, it's leaving this waste material behind and it creates this cocoon, if you, if you will, of its own waste. Um, and that protects it in a way because it is a soft body uh, scale or a soft body type of scale. Um, mealybugs uh, can have their, it's, it's, it's unattractive. It's not the worst thing for your plant. In other words, your plant is not going to expire after a week or two weeks of this. Um, it's such a common problem. What it's doing is they're eating the sap of the plant. Um, but it does affect the general health of the plant and it could open it to further disease. Um, it could open it to further types of in, uh, insects. Um, and then also for like in your, in your home, 
Um, a lot of times mealybugs and ants, ants kind of farm the mealybug for the waste material of the mealybug and there's this thing that goes on and so then all of a sudden you have ants in your house and mealybugs. <laughs> you have a little insect agricultural thing going on and that may not be something everybody wants. Um, very easy to take care of this. A little bit of rubbing alcohol, uh, cotton swab, you wipe them right off. Um, another method is to spray them off with a strong fine mist of water. Personally, I don't like that so much because you're spraying those mealybugs everywhere and the, and the, the larva of the mealybugs. However, it, it does work. It's very effective and very quick. Um, and it's not as tedious as cotton swabbing your entire plant. Um, so if you do choose to use the water spraying off, maybe take it to an area that's, I'll call it quarantined. That's the word of the <laughs> the time now, but but you you know to where it's its own its own area to where you spray the mealybugs off, and if they have no other plant material to go to or place to hide, um, that may be an effective way to get rid of them. Uh, let's see if there's so another thing is you can if you want you can do a water alcohol combination as a spray. And that's effective too, like on a spray bottle and just squirt, 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 squirt. The mealybugs, are, they're going to dissolve in front of your eyes uh, with that. So you do about 50-50 water alcohol. Uh, and that's what I use at home. Um, it, I believe that I'm killing the mealybug at the same time instead of spreading it around. So uh, if, it, if it works. Uh, next we'll talk about um, a slip in uh, my... My slide, we're gonna talk about aphids. Um, I'll wing this one. Uh, I deal with these often, so I'm fairly familiar with them. The aphids are the little things that look like grains of pepper on the very, on the tip of that flower coming off the succulent. Um, aphids are a little bit more serious than uh, the mealybug. They do a little bit more damage and they also can have a relationship with ants. Ants are farming what's their waste, which is called honeydew. It's sort of a sugary waste substance. Uh, you can recognize this by a stickiness on your plant, and that's that actual honeydew. Uh, sometimes you can even see it. It's very, it's kind of a, like a glistening. Um, and uh, enough of this can Courage, then you get black city mold that's that the black city mold is growing on the honeydew so it just becomes this little ecosystem you really don't want on your plants um, so aphids are fairly easy to get rid of too you can do the spraying method once again where are those aphids going when you spray them off your plant be cognizant of that cognizant of that um, another way of dealing with this is uh so you can just do some vegetable oil. Uh, this is the homeowner's way of doing it. Vegetable oil with soapy water. And what you're doing is you're making a very viable concoction of a, what's, what pesticide applicators call a sticky spreader. Um, and so the, the vegetable oil is allowing that to stick, stick to the plant and the soap is actually allowing it to then uh, spread or wait, I'm saying that the other way around. The the oil is making it is letting it, allowing it to spread, and the soap is letting it stick to the plant. Um, and that'll basically suffocate the aphids, and then you clean them off the normal way. Um, let's see with aphids, what else can I tell you? Uh, they they do do a tremendous amount of damage, and you will you will see uh, with discolored leaves, uh, shriveled sunken leaves. Um, they are also, they're taking the sap out of the plant and um, you'll see damage from them within a week or two, uh, unlike the mealybug. So these are a little bit more serious, not as common in the home unless you bring them in, in with the plant, which is also entirely possible. Let me stop here and too and say one good practice to have with when you're bringing plants home from anywhere, um, from one environment to the other, is have an area that you do have a quarantine or a timeout or a place to where they sort of gently come in. And during that time, you can be inspecting this plant and looking for things that maybe you don't want in your home. Uh, and I think a lot of times we just buy a plant and we go and decorate with it. 
Um, so, which is fine, but as an end result, you want to kind of think, think it through a little bit because these are living things with other living things on them. Um, spider mites. Uh, these you can't really see with the eye. The other two you can. Um, and uh, they're like, they're, they're called spiders, but they're actually a little mite. Um, they come with temperature and humidity is where you'll, you'll see populations of them explode. Um, you treat it the same way as mealybug. It's very easy. Um, why I bring this one up, it's, so this is less common on succulents per se, but it's more common on house plants in general. I think it's because we have home environments that are very conducive to this little guy. Um, so with the mealybugs, you just do the alcohol or the alcohol spray. Uh, this might take a couple applications of doing it. Um, this is more serious than the mealybug. You'll see damage to your plant similar to aphids within a week or, or maybe even less because it's so quick. And if there's a big population, they, uh, you'll see the results. Some of the things you'll look for are, are a graying of the plant that may look different on succulents than regular green leaf plants. Um, but like if it's a green leaf succulent, you're gonna see a graying, if you will. You're gonna see a, a de definitely, a, it's, a it's, a, it's a loss of the color um, with these guys. And then, um, one thing you want to do is isolate your plant immediately with these um, because they're very mobile. They're going to be spinning little webby things between plants um, and then treat it that way. Uh, so you're not going to be able to see them. It's not going to give you pre-warning, but you will see the damage. So, uh, and then you have some time to take care of it before that damage gets too bad. Um, and the final pest that is very common, this is probably the most common to succulents. And you see the little dark dots all over that. So that's actually, what, that, that's a, a hard scale. Um, and uh, let's see what I can say about the scales. They're, they're basically doing the same thing. Um, they're very easy to get rid of in terms of you can just scrape that off or brush it off, or you can use a alcohol um, with a Q-tip directly and take care of it. Um, so even though these are more common, they're not the most damaging to your plants. They are unsightly and they definitely could long-term create problems for your plant. They're not going to, they're not going to, and, and, and a lot of times too with scale, even at the conservatory, they take care of themselves a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see them on an aloe or jade plant. And so I'll keep my eye on that. And then within a, a couple of weeks or something, I'll come by. And so maybe that scale has moved to something else versus the plant that I noticed it on. But um, with these, another thing that's very effective is that sticky spreader that I was talking about. And really, if you don't want to make up your own, you can just buy a horticultural oil that they sell at any retail nursery or big box store or hardware store. You ask for horticultural oil. And, and then if and you can also, or you can also use neem if you like, and that's effective as well. Um, or you can find a horticultural oil with neem, that's ideal. Um, so we'll move on to temperature and humidity, but I guess we'll go back to scale or pest for a second. If you have any questions about this, um, please, uh, please put it in the chat or feel free to contact me uh, you know, at any point in time. Uh, this is a, a good topic to, uh, for the homeowner. Um, so temperature and humidity. Okay. Succulents, they are a wide variety of ecotypes. Generally, it's warm and arid, um, but that can be a mountaintop in <coughs> Iran, <laughs> you, you know, uh, so it's not as it's it's not as intuitive as you'd think it would be. Um, Sorry. However, so whereas lighting in homes may not be ideal for succulents always, temperature and humidity usually is because our homes tend to be warm and arid, uh, especially with conditioned air, um, and that mimics what most of the 
type of uh, the environment that, that these plants come from. Um, that's for indoor plants. Uh, there are outdoor succulents too, which we're going to talk about, and those are able to take a wider range of temperatures and, and be successful. Um, whereas a lot of succulents that you buy um, at a nursery are not really able to withstand, especially Chicago uh, winters specifically. Um, let's, let's see. Uh, so just keep in mind with succulents that they, some of them can survive at temperatures. Uh, I have a hundred, more than a hundred degrees. Um, rarely are they going to survive in anything below freezing though. So, uh, ideal temperature range is the 45 to 85 and that's perfect summer temperatures for Chicago. Um, and it's also very easy to get in your homes year round as well with some adjustments. So that's why these plants make really good house plants. Um, <clears throat> Uh, last thing, so the other thing I want to talk about is containers. Um, I've got some exam uh, <laughs> examples of many different types of containers. Uh, succulents tend to be very shallow rooted. So they're not as deeply rooted. They're, they're, the roots are mostly, get, mostly be hanging out on the, the surface and they will send some feeder roots down, down low. Um, the one important point I want to make about containers is ideally they will have a drainage hole. Like a, a lot of these that you'll see in the lower right hand corner are very cute, but they may not drain well. And that's the number one killer to succulents uh, is standing in water. Uh, uh, and Ken's brought up before too, uh, uh, water, uh, the trays at the bottom, the drip trays can not, you know, if it's holding water in there, that's not really great for your succulent, uh, which is very true. Um, but uh, because they're shallow rooted, you can get by with doing really cool things like the wall hanging, um, you know, in the, the left-hand picture. And I think that's a great picture because you have this very large succulent below it. And that container is probably a 10 to 12 inch container, maybe bigger by the scale of the picture. Um, and then you have this, uh, wall art or this uh, living wall above it um, and the soil on that is probably only the profile you know if you turn it that way it's probably only a few inches and the succulents are totally able to thrive and survive in that kind of situation uh, and these kind when they're vertical you can spray and mist them because the water is not going to be hanging out on a horizontal surface it's going to mostly evaporate or fall off um, I, I think I wanted to show just a wide variety with this slide. Um, so let your imagination go. There's a little pitcher, you know, like a water pitcher in the back too. Um, there was a phase a while ago where people were putting them in old boots, <laughs> you know, uh, have fun with it. That's what these plants are about. Um, so with that said, drainage holes are ideal. Um, you can get by with putting a third of the container with gravel. And you can even do that with small containers. I have some, some at home that I do that with as well, just because I really like the container. Um, and I'll put like a third of gravel, you know, to where the, the water can stand in there, stay in there. And then, um, uh, then the regular cactus or the succulent mix. Um, and then with the, if you do it that way and there's no drainage hole, you just want to water half as much if that makes sense. You're wanting to displace, you don't want the, the whole water profile to be the container. Uh, you just want it to go through the soil, work its way through the soil, and then, um, you know, hang out in the bottom gravel until it uh, evaporates. Um, another thing you can do is add a drainage hole uh, with a ceramic or masonry bit. Um, I've done that before. Uh, it's pretty common to do. It takes a little bit of skill, um, but very doable with a lot of different materials. Um, the other thing I think I want to bring up too with, when I'm talking about containers is um, succulents can be uh, uh, as a floral display or a temporary display also. Um, with the wall, the living wall behind you, they change those panels out. Um, not all the time, but it's possible to do that. 
Um, a lot of times plants are just pretty and they bring some immediate joy to the house. I personally see nothing wrong with that. It's not like this is a cut bouquet. It'll last a lot longer, but I do think one important thing with plants is to connect with them and to bring them into your home and for them to remind you of the beauty that's around us. And uh, so we might not all have collections, but it's also okay just to have uh, temporary plants or um, that's a, I, I wish I, I could think of a better word, but I think you all know what I'm, tr I'm getting at. Um, or, or wait until that plant flowers. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'll, I'll leave that at containers. Once again, any questions, let me know. Um, this is a broad topic. Um, we're going to move on to propagation. And these are some pictures from the conservatory. We kind of, we propagate things. They're very easy to propagate. Um, there's just some steps that you have to take. And essentially, the pictures, what you can see is, is the different phases that you go through. And the first phase, um, I have a learning uh, aid here. So the first phase is you'd remove a, a leaf and then you let it dry for a couple of days or a week, depending. Um, and you're looking for and you're looking for a callus to form, which would be the second picture. So the phases, I guess, before I show you, the phases are going to be to dry it out, scab it over, and then you you uh, get plantlets, and that may take a couple of weeks. But eventually, if you look closely at that that third picture, you're going to start to see little baby plantlets. And then once those plantlets are big enough to survive on their own you actually have new plants, which is the last picture. And so I'll show you the first step. I'm gonna take this leaf off right here at the bottom and you just don't wanna snap the leaf off. Um, what you really wanna do is use a pair of snips or sharp knife. Um, and you're, you're gonna to want to get as much of the leaf while leaving the stem. And let's see if I can do this. Um, you won't be able to see what I'm doing, but this isn't magic. So I'm going to try and get this. <clears throat> okay, I've loosened it enough to where I think I can. Yeah. So, um, where's my camera? Oh, there's the camera. You can see the end of that where I took it off is pretty, is concave and that's a good surface to go from. So what I do with this is take it to the first thing and let it sit and dry out. And I'm gonna then, I'll see this area start to whiten and maybe tiny little rootlets or hairs start to come out. And that's really all it takes. Um, I hope that all showed up on the Zoom, the magic of Zoom. Um, if not, I have this handy dandy little thing I got from the internet. And once again, you can come back and print the slide out or save it or something to where you have a little primer. Um, so the, the two basic ways of uh, propagating succulents are from leaves or stem cuttings. And that kind of depends on the kind that you have. Um, and so <coughs> sort of like the first slide I told you, which is you, um, you dry out the, the stem of the leaf, you let it form a callus, you scab it over, you get it onto some planting soil, um, and uh, you and what, yeah, you don't want that in bright light. You want it to sort of be you know being taken care of, and then you you'll miss that soil a little bit. You're not missing the plant, you're missing the soil. Um, from stem cuttings, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, it works just as well. Uh, you you want to dry that stem out and you may not get roots showing up on the stem immediately, although you, you could. Um, and you'll, then you'll put that in a pot or something and give it a little bit more water. Um, and so that's propagation. And there's probably tons of questions on this. Feel free to ask them. Um, definitely try this. It doesn't hurt. If you have succulents at home, have a little tray set aside in a filtered, uh, an area with filtered light, 
that's your experiment station. And eventually you are gonna get results and it is so fun to see those cute little baby plants become a full viable plant on its own. Um, so this, that's the section on basically the basic care. I threw a lot at you. Um, we're gonna talk about types of succulents now. So like I said before, succulents are basically any plant that is storing water in the leaves, stems, or roots. Um, the succulents that we buy can be identified by their botanical name or their scientific name, same thing. Um, and the reason we do that is so we know there's a common language of plants to use, uh, or you know, a common language to use for plants. Um, so when Ken and I are talking about Acrasiola ovata, we're talking about the same plant, um, most likely. Um, the basics of, so you don't have to become a botanist to do this, but just sort of this confuses a lot of people and the, it, it goes family, genus, species. Um, the, the, the names you're gonna be using are genus and species. Um, the, then you might see things that come after that, the genus and the species, such as Crassula genus, uh, species ovata, Crassula ovata. But you might see something that comes after it like Gollum in, in uh, single quotes. Um, that's talking about a variety. Uh, or it could also be mentioning a subspecies. Or it could be a cultivar. It could be a couple of different things. It could be a, uh, but uh, really you want to be concerned with the genus and the species and then the name uh, or the, the, the common name. And common names I think are important um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, common names are um, an easier way to communicate about plants. Um, common names tell us a lot about the cultural meaning of the plant a lot of times. I think that's interesting. Um, I really like the connection between plants and people. So I focus on things like that or look, I, you know, I'm interested in things like that. Um, common names are just as important, but also not without a genus or a species. So you wanna know both. Um, let's see what else I can tell you about that. Um, you know what, Kent, it's Judy. I just want to interject. Um, we are um, winding up on time. So I just wanna make a note of that and maybe we can flip through some more of your um, slides oh, that you are the must have slides. Yeah. So we okay. allow some time for questions. How much time do we have, Judy? Well, it's 10 to eight. Okay. And so, um, Okay. I would say, you know, if you can zip through the next uh, few yeah. slides. Absolutely. And we can take some questions. Well, I think so the types of succulents, the, I, I, the why it's important is because between these two, Sempervivum and Echeveria, which are two um, uh, genus, uh, they are, off, they're both called hens and chicks as a common name. But they're two very, very different plants. Um, uh, for instance, and why this is important is the Sempervivum can tolerate a freeze. Uh, it can be put outside and left outside. The Echeverias cannot, even though they look the same and they, they have the same style of leaf and the flowers look similar. So it is very important to know what you have. Um, so we're going to kind of go through the families, families in the genus. I think I'll just point them out really quick. Um, the uh, first one we're going to talk about is sedum. These are known as stone crops. Uh, you'll see the you know, burrow's tail, the donkey's tail, uh, which is the lower picture, or the string of pearls is another very common one. <coughs> and um, usually it's a hanging plant. Um, these plants are very hard. Um, sedums, uh, and sedums can be, uh, are grown on rooftops as well. Uh, they're grown as annuals. There are perennial sedums. Uh, sedum autumn joy. Uh, so this is a wide variety of plants and very useful to the gardener indoors and out. The echeverias are very fancy, very fancy. They're very fancy plants. They're very popular because they're pretty, uh, lots of interesting colors. It's got that tight rosette. The flower looks beautiful. Um, uh, and they, they're very easily hybridized and you'll see a lot of these. We have some for sale at the conservatory now. We have a uh, pearl one uh, Nuremberg, and it is a Royal Horticulture Society Award of Merit um, plant, as many succulents are. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, same family, Crassulaceae, which is the largest family of nursery crop succulents. <clears throat> and this is the cotyledon. These you see as bear paws. The reason I include both pictures, they're both bear paws and they're both cotyledon tomatosa. The lower one, or the one on the right, is a subspecies of the, so it's the same plant. It's like they're cousins or something. It, they look very, very different, except growth and flower and things like that is how botanists are going to tell them apart. So these tend to be a, a kind of on a woody stem and a very fleshy uh, plant. Um, very pretty and very interesting. <clears throat> what else can I tell you about these? Um, oh, these are... Um, these are useful in the Arabian Peninsula for removing corns off your feet. Um, next we're going to go to the uh, Pachypitums. Pachy, uh, Pachypitums. Pachypitum. Uh, these are moonstones. Uh, these are from Mexico. Uh, very cool plant. They grow on a stalk with these very, they're also called a sugar almond um, because it kind of looks like a sugar almond. Uh, very colorful. Uh, and these are becoming uh, these are highly desired, but becoming more available in the nursery trade. Another Crassulaceae is Grapopetalum. Uh, this one's ghost plant, uh, silver plant. Um, it's also called leather petal. Um, this one's, uh, the top one is, uh, you'll see that in Arizona. I mean, endemic to Arizona, uh, northern Mexico and parts of Arizona. Um, and it's, uh, it looks like an echeveria, but it grows on a stalk. Um, and then the flowers come up on a stalk. And I think that's why it's popular in the nursery trade. It's got these beautiful flowers that, you know, come up and it's kind of like this star-shaped flower. Uh, clanchos. Clanchos, um, uh, the one on the upper right is the panda plant, the tomentosa, and then you also have the flapjacks. There's hundreds of these different kinds of clanchos. They're South African or Southern Africa plant. Um, and uh, they can get really, we have one in the conservatory that's like six feet tall. Uh, we have some that are small little ground covers. So there's a wide variety of growth and they all do well as house plants. Um, Used to be related to the clancho is the bryophyllum, and this is the mother of thousands. And I think in this, you can see that it's, it's uh, sending off these little plantlets. Uh, there's a scientific name for it, I don't know right now, but it's these little plantlets and they'll fall off and will become its own plant. Um, hence the name mother of thousands. Uh, the problem with this plant is it is, you can imagine invasive, um, and there, there is one that's invasive in Hawaii that's particularly prob problematic, and I think it's Pinata, Bryophyllum Pinata. Um, then here's my favorite, Aeonium. Aeonium are, very, are rosettes on a very tall stalk. Um, they are, I think I'll bring up about this one really quick, because they are monocarpic, meaning when they flower, that's the end of their life cycle. Um, it takes a while. It's not an annual. It's not a one year, but a beautiful flower. And they slow, slowly sort of produce that. Um, Sempervivums do that too. Um, and uh, these are used in the landscape in the Southwest fairly frequently or in California, the, the Aeoniums. And they can be, uh, some can be three feet tall, some can be three inches tall. They're just a really charming plant. Um, Here's the Andromiscus, and, in, and it's, it's the key lime, and it's recognized by the little hairs that grow on it. And all the different Andromiscus, there's hundreds of different kinds, all are going to have one of those little hairs or so, some type of hair on the stalk. Um, here's the Sempervivums that, are, that these, can, these are hardy to the outside. Um, they're known as hens and chicks also, but, uh, and then also house leek. Um, the little fun fact about these is they've been grown for centuries on the top of homes throughout the world um, to protect from fire and lightning um, and still are today, like in Norway or in Wales. Um, house leek is the common name. 
And then we come to Crassula, the Crassulacea family and Crassula. And this is the jade plant, Crassula ovata. And the one on the smaller one is also a Crassula ovata, but it's, all, it's a variety, it's either Hobbit or Gollum. I think this one's Gollum. Um, this one is a very tree-like uh, succulent. Uh, they're quite long lived. Uh, they can go quite large, they can get three feet tall. Um, and they have a beautiful flower that you can induce um, uh, with cool temperatures, short days, and just remove, slowly cut back on the water a little bit, and it goes into a flowering cycle. Um, and then we have aloe. This is a different family, not, no longer Crassulaceae. The aloe is um, probably one of the more well-known, and it can be used for food, uh, medicinal, um, it's used in cosmetics and definitely ornamental. These can grow uh, from the ground as a ground cover, or they can uh, grow in trees, or they can become a tree. These are aloes too. Um, I wanted to throw this one in there because a lot of people see these. Uh, this is Aezoacea family, the living stones. And both pictures in the middle and on the lower right are in that family, um, they're very, very pretty, very problematic to grow at home. They take very specific conditions. Uh, people buy them because they're very cute and they're very short-lived and that's kind of depressing. Um, they're short-lived because we kill them. They're very, they're very, very, uh, very specific conditions for this plant. Um, and they kind of, they split in the middle and then split into the half and that's the living stone. Another, another possibility is the focaria. Um, that's the uh, animal tooth plant, and that's the very top. Um, same family, uh, much easier to grow. You get beautiful flowers off of it as well, these golden flowers. And yeah, a little bit more successful to grow than the lithops, the living stones, but they are related. Uh, and then we have the uh, Portulacarias, uh, and we have one of these at the conservatory that's quite old. Um, these are, unlike the jade plant, these are edible. You can eat the leaves and the stems, I found that out. Um, they're endemic to Madagascar, um, and a fairly easy plant to grow into a very satisfying house plant with the, uh, under easy conditions as well. Oh, uh, I don't know what happened to the last slide. Let me try and find that. So that concludes the lecture. I hope I didn't go too far over. Um, there we go. This is the last slide. This is just some resources. Very quickly, um, the CSS uh, GC is local and there's the, there's the uh, web pages for it. Um, that's the Cactus Club we all hear about. And Bill Abel is, or was the leader of that. And he's also at the very, very bottom, was the girl with Ted's Greenhouses. Um, I like uh, the Henry Shaw Cactus Succulent Society. It's kind of been around forever. Um, I use the succulent guide personally uh, all the time. It's a sister to the cactusguide.com. Very easy to use, very easy to ID plants on. Um, it's user friendly and it's not the information you're going to get on it is a good solid information. Uh, then of course our local display gardens and then some of the sales and sources. Uh, and um, we're doing some, some sales online. Uh, I think it went live today. Um, we've been propagating and growing these succulents. Um, and then uh, I know that uh, a really cool site that I use too is the sill.com. Um, but it's a little bit expensive. Uh, the sill is kind of the higher end plants for, uh, but really cool plants. So anyway, that's uh, the presentation and thank you for your interest. Okay, um, I have one comment to make and then uh, we're gonna take questions. I've got a bunch of them here, but we'll, I'll pick the ones that I think will mean, be most meaningful. So, my comment is, if you know the genus and species of any succulent that you have, Google is an unbelievable mm -hmm. resource for, you, you'll find it on Google, you'll find 10 entries for it, you'll see a dozen images of it, mm -hmm. and you'll find all kinds of information on, you know, 
what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And uh, I think it, I find it very helpful. Uh, first question is, um, what sort of a uh, indoor light do you recommend, uh, Kent? Uh, I like the LED lights now. Um, they've become very cost effective. Uh, Amazon, of course, but you can also go to buy, you can find, uh, you can find an LED bulb. Uh, and when I say LED, I mean LED plant bulb. Uh, it, it'll be listed as a plant um, and it'll have a spectrum. Some of them have the full spectrum. Um, some of them are only specifically for blooming. Um, that's getting a little bit more specialized, but you can pick up a bulb that'll last for, uh, I've had one that's lasted for three years um, at $13. And I'll use that as supplemental lighting on house plants um, to get me through the, the winters and things like that. Um, where, where does one find LED light bulbs like this? Is, is that going to be at Showers Hardware Store or so, must you go on Amazon to find them? Uh, so I bought mine off Amazon, but I have noticed them at my local Friendly Ace store. That's not a, that's not a plug, but it's just down the street. Um, I will say that fluorescent bulbs, um, because they've been around longer, are a lot less expensive. And there's more types of them, like small ones, large four-foot ones. Um, some that some that just stick under a cabinet. Um, a lot of the grow lights we get are uh, fluorescent. Good. Um, another one is uh, so I move my succulents outside in the spring, and we have our annual deluge of rain right. day after day. What can I do to deal with that overwatering challenge? So. Uh, Number one killer of succulents is overwatering. Um, I would say uh, be very, when you're moving your plants out in the spring, do it in phases. Um, in other words, don't just set them out and forget them. Um, really be aware that we're in this, this uh, you know, tempestuous time of the year. Um, uh, put them in a sheltered location. You can put them under an overhang or under a porch, if you, I mean, not deep under the porch, but at the edge of the porch where it's going to get some sun um, on your front porch. Um, yeah, just protect them generally and be ready to move them too. So maybe put them on a tray or a cart or something like that until we're over the, the rough weather. My comment that I would add to that is that mm -hmm. I, it's really important if you take your plants outside to not let them have trays under them so that when it pours rain, the trays fill oh, up with yeah. water and then they soak and soak and soak. Yeah. So you yeah. want them to be, you know, in a situation where they're not going to accumulate yeah. water in yeah. those heavy rains. Very true. Um, there's a question, What's, what are some succulents that are good for a hanging basket? Ha. <laughs> Um, the string of dolphins is a good one. The sedums generally, sedums generally grow over and they hang. Um, those are good filler plants also. Um, so yeah, the grapapetalums make nice little hanging. They're more of a specimen hanging over. Um, yeah, things like okay. that. Yeah. Good. How about if I want to turn my succulent little tree into a bonsai? Which are, which are good ones that would work for that? Uh, the classic training plant for a bonsai is actually a jade plant. When people are learning how to bonsai, they give them jade plants. Uh, it's very resilient, uh, very cool shape, um, easy to prune and to cut and to keep to a size, uh, and it takes the form well. Um, another one I would say would be the Portulacaria, if you can get, and we're, I'm actually just propagated some Portulacaria aphras today, which was the last slide I showed you, and those make beautiful little bonsai plants. Um, here's one which I think you touched on, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows about this. So the conservatory is going to have this succulent sale, which is starting uh, now. <laughs> How do I get on there online and where can I pick up my plants after I put down my, my payment? Right. Um, so I, a link should be shared. Uh, if not, there's one on the uh, website. 
uh, the PDOP or the conservatory website. Um, and yeah. so from my understanding of it is you place them online um, and we're gonna, the next day or the next time we're at work, we're gonna get those orders, uh, or the net meaning the next time we're open to the public and there's a receptionist there to give us the orders. And uh, then we're gonna go collect those plants from the ones we have in the back and put an order together and arrange a pickup time. Great. Yeah. Um, well, my, my wife is giving me a hint from the side here that the website that is best to go to is the Park District website. And there's some kind of an order online yep. uh, category that you can open up. Um, all right, so I'm kind of running out of questions. There's one or two more. Can I do them, Judy? Oh. I'm, well, I'm going to do one or two more, and then I think I, we're going to wind things up. Yep. Here's one where, gee, I have a pretty big jade tree. And I think you alluded to this, but what can I do? How, how far, do I, how, how far in the, to the fall do I leave it out? in order to get it cold enough so it thinks it needs to put out flowers? Oh, uh, well, I wouldn't, I couldn't say necessarily how long you could leave it out. You don't want it to freeze. <laughs> so before it freezes, um, you want the temperature, you want the, the sh it's, it's gonna flower under shorter days and cooler temperatures and less water. So if you, let's say you control the water uh, we do know shorter days start happening at the uh, fall or the autumnal equinox, uh, September, in, end of September. So when we start getting shorter, the days are becoming shorter and shorter. So you can use that as a guide. Um, I'm not from Chicago, so you might be able to speak to that, uh, Ken, or somebody else. In terms of the weather here, it still freaks me out a little bit <laughs> because it's, you know, not as gentle as Oregon. Uh, but but uh, I, I would say probably before November. Um, what, what about, yeah. My, my comment would be, yeah. if we, we have a big jade tree. And if I leave it out to the point where its leaves start to get tinged with oh. red, yeah. and it, I know it's feeling a little bit of stress because of the temperature going down to 40 at night. Mm -hmm. if it, that experience for a while and then we bring it in it will be covered with beautiful fragrant white flowers so it's so I've only seen the flowers once uh, does, does yours flower consistently it, I have had years when I have put it in a particular spot in my yard and it's and I and I've done all these things that I just mentioned and it ends up at Christmas time covered with white flowers. Okay. There's been other years when I haven't put it in that specific spot and I haven't done as well with it. So there's there you go. Tricky little aspects to this. Okay. I can tell you that when Sue and I lived in Culver City, California, we had a huge jade tree in our backyard. And I can tell you that it would get down to 30 at night mm -hmm. in Culver City. But I will tell you, both years that we lived there, that that little jade, that big jade tree was covered with flowers. Okay. So it has to have a little bit of cold stress and obviously the shorter uh, days. Yeah, and succulents. Happens. Succulents are succulents are not so much light dependent on their flowering cycle. They're more temperature and. Uh, Day length, if you will, not you know. So it's so it's the the amount of light they're not getting <laughs> versus the amount of light they're getting, All right. uh, and temperature and and uh, the the intensity of light also would be, and that's common with a lot of suc most succulents. All right. So I think that we are at the ten minute after eight mark, and I think we're going to wind up. I am going to, but, but I will say mm -hmm. before I wind up, we really appreciate that beautiful presentation. I know what went into it, Ken, and it really was excellent. Good. Thank you. So a couple of, couple of announcements. There's going to be another Zoom uh, session like this on August 5th 
which is going to be about food preservation, what to do with all your strawberries, peaches, green beans and tomatoes for the winter. Uh, and the speaker is a woman named Emily P Pastor. And I think she'll cover everything from canning to drying to freezing to all kinds of good stuff. So that's next Wednesday night, probably same time. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say is, I hope that all of you that are out there in part, in, in, taking, play, take, taking part in this program tonight are members of FOPCON, but if you are not, the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory is a really nice group of people it gives you all kinds of little perks, like you can get into many uh, um, botanical gardens all over the United States. If you're a member of the uh, Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, you know, Wisconsin, California, the Chicago Horticultural or Botanic Garden, blah, blah, blah. So it is well worth the the uh, annual dues cost and it's a bunch of real nice people. So I recommend that you consider that if you're not a part of it. And I think that's basically it. Anything else you want to uh, say, uh, Kent or Judy? And then I think we're gonna wind up. I really appreciated doing this. And I think this is pretty cool. I hope this is a great way to get information across. I mean, I don't even know how many people are out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we've got a nice crowd. I say, <laughs> if you'd like to unmute, you guys can unmute and, um, you know, chat with Kent and Ken. Um, it, it was a fantastic, very thorough presentation. I learned so much, Kent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ken, thank you so much for um, being the host. Um, you guys are welcome to unmute if you'd like and uh, chit chat a little bit more um, if, if you're interested, um, but this is this was a fantastic presentation and we've got a lot more in store, not just next week, but coming for fall. We have some really great programming we're working on. So thank you all for being here. Good night all. Good night. <laughs> all right, now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs>